Good afternoon and welcome to our uh, first afternoon panel. Uh, we have four panelists. Two of those will be joining us via Skype. And I would like to go ahead and introduce all four of our speakers. And then we will proceed in the order that is listed in the program. And in the end, we'll hopefully have time for questions. Uh, my name is Maya Horn, and I'm a professor here in the Department of Spanish and Latin American Cultures and Africana Studies. <clears throat> so our first presentation is a joint presentation by Angelique Nixon and Rosamund King. Um, Angelique Nixon is currently a Fulbright Scholar at the University of West Indies, um, St. Augustine. She writes and teaches about Caribbean studies, African diaspora literatures, feminist and postcolonial theories, and gender and sexuality studies. Her work has been published widely in several academic and creative journals, uh, including Black Renaissance Noir, journal, journal of Caribbean Literatures, among several others, and Small Exelon. Um, she's also very much an active author and writer of poetry and has published a collection called Saltwater, Saltwater Healing, a Myth, Memoir, and Poems. She's in the process of publishing her first scholarly book titled Resisting Paradise, Tourism, Diaspora, and Sexuality in Caribbean Literature and Culture. Um, Angelique is also deeply invested in grassroots activism and is involved with several organizations, including the IT Resurrect, Caribbean IRN, and Critical Resistance. Our second speaker is Rosamund King. Um, she's a critical and creative writer and artist and a professor of English in, at Brooklyn College where she teaches courses in Caribbean literature, creative writings, and sexuality in African diaspora. Her fabulous book, Island Bodies, Transgressive Sexualities in the Caribbean Imagination, was published by the University Press of Florida in 2014. Um, her scholarship also has appeared in numerous journals and collections, including, for example, Kal Kalalu and the Journal of West Indian Literature. She has received numerous honors, uh, including a Fulbright Award, a Woodrow Wilson, a Mellon, and a Ford Foundation Award, um, among several other, others. She's also, uh, like Angelique, a poet and an artist and a performer. And her, her poems have appeared in several dozen journals and anthologies, and she has performed widely across different spaces, um, including the Poets House, the African Performance Art Biennial, and the Encuentro Performance Festival. Um, Professor King's community and professional service have included being a member of the Boards of Organization of African Women Writers, the Audre Lorde Project, and the Center for Lesbian Gay Studies at the City University of New York. Then our second uh, presentation. Third? No, there you have a joint presentation. <laughs> <laughs> our second presentation, also via Skype, will be, will be by Tanya Hayes, who's um, currently at the University of West Indies, Barbados, where she received a PhD in Gender and Development Studies at the Institute of uh, Gender and Development Studies. Uh, her dissertation is entitled Mapping the Knowledge Economy of Gender in the Caribbean, 1974 to 2010. And her research, in research interests include social and political thought, gender and new media, men and masculinities, and feminist epistemologies. Her creative work, has been published in Anthurium, a Caribbean studies journal, and in the Caribbean writer. Um, her essay titled The Divine and the Demonic, Sylvia Winter and Caribbean Feminist Thought Revisited is part of an edited collection called Love and Power, Caribbean Discourses on Gender, um, published by the U UWI Press. Currently, and very importantly, she's the coordinator of Code Red for Gender Justice, which organized the Kachafaya New Generation Caribbean Feminist Grounding, and um, as part of that, she has actively taught social media workshops for activists in Barbados. Last but not least, to my right, is Keith McNeil. He's an associate professor of anthropology in the Department of Comparative Cultural Studies at the University of Houston. He's a cultural anthropologist and comparative religionist with specialization in Caribbean ethnology and Atlantic history. Um, his first book, Trans and Modernity in the Southern Caribbean, African and Hindu Popular Religions in Trinidad and Tobago, um, was also published by the University Press of Florida and offers a comparative historical ethnography of African and Hindu religions. Um, he has several other uh, research projects that are forthcoming, including um, um, work that is related to ritual and performance studies, um, for example, drag performance in Atlanta, Georgia, in the US, 
as well as more recent work on the embodied symbolism and visual cultures of trans performance and spirit mediumship in the Southern Caribbean. And his current book project concerns the politics of sexuality and citizenship in Trinidad and Tobago. So let's welcome our speakers, and I look forward to productive conversations and to our speakers' presentations. Thank you, Maya, for the introductions, um, and Kelly for inviting us to share our work. We are actually giving a joint presentation, so just so you know what's actually going to happen, I'm going to speak a little bit, and then Angelique is going to speak, and then I'm going to speak again to give you, um, so I'll start with a little bit of the background. The International Resource Network is an internet-based project created by the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies, also known as CLAGS, for people who are in New York, at the City University of New York, and it was created in 2002. The purpose of the IRN, and as you'll see, there's gonna be a lot of websites, so feel free to look on your own devices or copy down these links. The purpose of the IRN is to link researchers, activists, artists, and teachers from both academic and community bases in areas related to diverse sexualities. It strives to be a central internet location at irnweb.org for people interested in approaching sexual rights and human rights from the perspective of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer studies, or who are interested in surveying research on particular sexual minority issues around the globe. And for reasons that people in this room probably already know, uh, we often use in the IRN the term sexual minority as opposed to the other terms. So there are, there are a number of regions that are part of the IRN, and Angelique and I are the co-chairs of the Caribbean IRN. So the Caribbean region, the, there used to be a Latin American and Caribbean region, and you know how that works out. So the Caribbean region was created um, as, as its own entity in 2008, and it connects academic and community-based researchers, artists, and activists around the Caribbean and the diaspora. Yes, there we go. Um, in areas related to diverse sexualities and genders. As more scholarship and activism inside and outside of the region is focusing on issues related to sexual minorities in the Caribbean, there's an increasing need for a clearinghouse to connect individuals around the region and the world who are doing this work. So the IRN is building a collection of such resources for people and organizations inside and outside of the region through our website, our email listserv, social media, digital archiving, and multimedia collections. Furthermore, the Caribbean IRN highlights and promotes activism within um, activism and creative work, as well as different kinds of engaged scholarship, which seek to question, provoke, and illuminate different ways of thinking about same-sex desire and sexual minorities. The Caribbean IRN supports and encourages regional projects, organizations, and collaborations. As it, and as Angelique will note, many of our projects have been collaborative. Our first major endeavor was actually an in-person gathering. We thought that that was important in 2009, and it was in Kingston, Jamaica, because everybody said we couldn't do it there, to determine our goals and priorities. At that time, over 30 artists, scholars, writers, and activists from around the region, representing over 10 Caribbean territories, were represented. Um, as well as several local and regional advocacy organizations such as Sasod from Guyana, Kaiso from Trinidad, JFLAG from Jamaica, and FOCO from Curacao. The gathering consisted of a panel discussion at the Caribbean Studies Association Conference, a five-hour workshop, and a closing reception slash FET. During these events, we networked and collaborated, and all of our current, all of our projects to date have their origins, their roots in, in the concerns and aspirations that were raised at that first in-person meeting. In addition to that gathering, our major accomplishments have included a major web presence connecting stakeholders, the creation of a digital archive with the Digital Library of the Caribbean, which we love, the establishment of a sexual minorities working group in the Caribbean Studies Association, the beginnings of our oral history project, a major collaboration with UWE, and of course the publication of our multimedia collection, which Angelique will focus on. We provide a monthly update to our far-reaching listserv, 
with cur addressing current debates and activities relating to Caribbean sexual minorities. If you're interested in that, you can email Caribbean, it's at the bottom of this screen, CaribbeanIRN at gmail.com. These updates include relevant news stories in the region and the diaspora, as well as conferences, opportunities, events, etc. We also have a Facebook page. I didn't bring up the Facebook page, but it, we're very easy to find there. And I'll just say something brief about our work with the Caribbean Studies Association. We created the first Caribbean, uh, the first sexualities working group within CSA, and that was in 2010. That's now a self-sustaining entity. It creates panels and discussions on sexuality for the annual CSA conference. We've been consulted to uh, make sure that sexuality studies is represented on the plenaries. And we, we encourage the CSA to be more open to regional activists in formal and informal ways. We were part of the group of people who um, encouraged them to make the conference free for local activists, regardless of what kind of activism that they're doing. Um, and so there has been a prominent sexuality studies presence at the CSA conference every year since 2009, bridging both Carib the, the communities in the Caribbean and diaspora and academia. Um, finally, we received a grant from the International Association for the Study of Sexuality, Culture, and Society, also known as ISACS, to create and present a graduate course on Caribbean sexualities with the University of West Indies St. Augustine that we also presented via, simultaneously via Skype to UE and Barbados and Cave Hill. And that collaboration has resulted in strengthening the already growing field of Caribbean sexuality studies within the region. And again, um, Angelique will give you the details on that. So, Angelique. Okay, Angelique, stop talking because we can't hear you. <laughs> Hold on a second. Okay. All right. You can hear yes. me now. Now we can hear you. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Rosamond, and thank you all for having us. Uh, present and talk to you about this work. It's really exciting to be a part of this virtually. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the theorizing homophobias in the Caribbean collection, the complexities of place, desire, and belonging. And as Rosamond already explained, this the idea for this collection came out of our meeting in Jamaica. And in fact, uh, Dr. Gayatri Gopinoff during that meeting said what she was sort of hearing from the room from a lot of people is that and with the attention on Caribbean homophobia, uh, and particularly in the, in the space of Jamaica, uh, kind of being a defining thing, uh, and often defined from the outside, uh, Gayatri suggested that maybe we should think about theorizing homophobias, that there are actually multiple kinds, and they work differently across the region, and that's what a lot of the activists and writers and artists were suggesting and scholars, community-based researchers who were in the room. And so we put out a call for this collection and one of our uh, inspirations, really thinking about the really important uh, collection by Thomas Glave, Our Caribbean, we thought really uh, thoroughly and in our introduction, Rosamond and I wrote for the piece, we use this as a way to kind of think about what is, what is another gathering look like. Uh, and so we wanted to continue these conversations uh, that began long ago and are continuing and thinking about the way that we imagine and we, we imagine ourselves and the way we think about desire. And at the same time, affirming the lives and experiences of sexual minorities across the region. And uh, so what we ended up with is a collection that represents mostly English-speaking territories, including Antigua and Barbuda, the Bahamas, Barbados, Jamaica, Guyana, and Trinidad and Tobago. And it also includes the Spanish and French and Dutch-speaking Caribbean, including Cuba, Puerto Rico, Haiti, Martinique, and Suriname. And so I'm going to quote briefly from our introduction. The collection refers to a complex range of sexual identities, preferences, and orientations, and includes a few voices engaging with trans identity. The collection crosses disciplines, intersects communities, bridges theory and activism, and highlights the relentless and strategic work of community workers, artists, activists, and scholars across the region. This may be the strongest element of the collection the bringing together or gathering of voices, continuing the work of our Caribbean, a gathering of gay and lesbian writings in the Antilles. This in a multiple, multiple media to offer a complex understanding of the Caribbean sexual landscape at home and abroad. 
And so some of the highlights of the collection, uh, Rosamond, I don't know if you want to scroll down so people can see the, the, uh, the menu, as it were, to see everything that's on there. So we have a collection, a multimedia collection of octopus reports, creative writing, critical essays, film, interviews, music, and visual and performance art that really reflect on the complexities of homophobias across the region and also expanding the awareness of sexual minority experiences and activism. And so we have visual art by Ewan Atkinson. We have a film and poem by Saku Charles and Colin Robinson. We have photography by Rodell Warner. We have music from Las Cruzas. We have a section of the film The Needle from Puerto Rico. We have interviews. Uh, one of the interviews that I conducted with an activist in Haiti, Steve Laguerre, who runs Cerovi. Uh, we also have an exclusive video interview with Larry Chang, the founder of the gay freedom movement in Jamaica, and Thomas Glay, which is a video interview. We commissioned activist reports from Colin Robinson, who is uh, the main chair of CAISO here in Trinidad and Tobago, and also the CAISO is the secretariat for CARIFLAGS, which is a region, one of the oldest regional organizations doing work on sexual minority issues. We also commissioned active reports from Vidiratha Kassoon uh, in Guyana, Erin Green in the Bahamas, and a number of other really important uh, interviews from representing a number of organizations across the region. We also came up with this idea to have an activist roundtable, and we called it Complexities of Place, representing five countries, and wanting to get a sense of what are some of the big issues. And you can actually go into that section called uh, the Activist Roundtable, and we have it separated by question, by person, and by country. And you can also see the questions, and you can see everyone's responses. So it's actually a really useful tool. Our coordination consultant, Vidyaratha Kassoon, who helped put this website together, he did this really, I think, a really dynamic way of kind of getting at the information. I think it's a very useful part of the collection. We also have two critical essays, and we have uh, creative writing, poetry, and fiction. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to use the site. You can, we have a scrolling bar along the side that you can see that have the categories. And when you open up those categories, we have summaries of each part, and as well as the main menu when you scroll down and you can see the entire menu. And like I said, you can also scroll down and you will see interviews by, uh, by country and person, which is also useful. And then also we have a list of the different uh, responses that we got, people writing about the collection when it came out in 2012. And what else can I tell you about this? Rosamond, is there anything? I'm not sure what, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what screen you're on. Let me see if I can figure that out. I'm just going through the different pages, so okay. you can keep talking. Okay, great, sorry. Okay, good. Uh, one of the other things uh, that I think is really important about our collection is that we also wanted to have a sense that theorizing does not have to be located only in the academy or through scholars. Like we wanted to think about theorizing through art, theorizing through visual, through theorizing through creativity, and through activists explaining and sharing their stories. If we wanted to, as the work of the IRN, as Rosamond explained earlier, really thinking about the ways that we bridge the gap between community and academia, and also making sure that this information is available uh, and accessible to much of the region. And this is a, the point of this conference, right, to think about the Caribbean digital, right, to think about the use of the internet, the use of the web, the use of online interface to really help us disseminate information. And one of the things that our, that our work has been grounded in, Rosamond and I, along with Colin and Vidya, who we also work with still, we have wanted to make sure that the information the, and, and, and as much of uh, the, the scholarship as well as all of the other aspects of, of the work are really, really available and accessible. And so using a website that's free and easily accessible. Uh, this also connects to our collection on the Digital Library of the Caribbean, which you might have heard about already, I think, earlier today. We have, we, we were really fortunate to partner with DLOC early on 
and we were able to acquire a collection of materials from Larry Chang's own personal collection that were, that were left in Jamaica. And we had access to this and we were able to digitize it and put it up for free open access through the lock. Uh, uh, do we want to open up that? Are you ready there, Rosemont? Yes, I'm at the Gay Freedom Movement page. Okay, great. And so this collection, and this collection really privileges the, the kinds of histories of sexual minorities that a lot of times the, the information coming out about Caribbean sexuality didn't really have and didn't really prioritize, I think, some of these stories, really from this sort of first-hand account. So the gay freedom movement has flyers and early organizing materials and newspaper articles and uh, notices about parties and notices about meetings and the early organizing of the Jamaican gay freedom movement in the 70s and 80s. And what we found, we found this collection of materials, we were really struck by uh, the way that it told a specific kind of story about what it meant to be uh, gay and lesbian and all the other names that we use or don't use uh, in the region and how that offered a different way to think about stories and to think about privileging the stories of sexual minorities in the region. And also the activism that was happening long, has been happening for a long time. Uh, and so you can actually go through and look at these materials and use them, check them out. Uh, we had a launch of this archive uh, in at Brooklyn College. I think it was in the summer of 2012. Is that right? I think, I think so. It was the summer of 2012. Yes, and we're really fortunate to have both Thomas and Larry, Thomas Glave and Larry. Uh, trying there with us and we also did a very much thinking about this idea of the digital Caribbean we actually had a very uh, well, well we, we hosted hubs in Jamaica and in Guyana and in Trinidad to share and talk about the collection with a whole range of people again going back to our mission of making sure that this information is accessible to a range of people and letting people know about it so uh, as you can see, there's so much information there. We also have a general archive on DLOC of materials that we have been collecting since we started meeting in 2009, from teaching and educational materials to photographs, newspaper articles, uh, essays that people are willing to share with us, their scholarship. Uh, and that sort of has fed into our Theorizing Homophobias collection and our second collection, which Rosamond will talk about in a few minutes. Uh, what I will close with is that after we did the short course, well, the, the, the point of the Sexuality Studies short course and the grant that we got, uh, the point was to make sure that information was available online. And we have just launched the materials for the short course. And you can see that on, on our blog, and it is also uploaded through DLOC. So you can see that on our blog, the Couldn't Iron blog, it's all laid out and gives you a sense of what we did over the, the four weeks. We also have a number of write-ups and videos from that class that the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, in, we interviewed all of the participants. We had over 22 participants who successfully completed the course with us for four weeks. And it was an intensive course and they came up with amazing and really, I think, important research projects uh, through that. And also we had a really, we shared in a really vibrant exchange about Caribbean sexuality and sexuality studies broadly. Uh, and so we're really excited that we have this material available. And in fact, right now I'm teaching a sexuality studies course at IGDS this semester, and I've been able to use a lot of that material. I was one of the facilitators of the course, so I was able to use not only some of the material that I came up with, but also the materials that all of us, the five instructors that we came up with and also pulled from the larger ISACs sexuality studies course. So it's been really exciting and the information has been incredibly useful and I've been able to expand it and share it with my students and we've had some really, really important and good conversations and they have a resource as well to go to online. And uh, I think that covers it. Rosamond, did I cover everything on our list? I think you did. That sounds great. And I'll just um, re-emphasize, uh, some of us were talking 
during lunch about how nice it is to look at other people's syllabi and things like that. And if you actually look at the course materials that we've uploaded, they include lectures, notes and handouts for students, outlines, and PowerPoints. Each module has all of that information. So it's really, a, and a bibliography. So it's really a wealth of information about sexual, sexuality studies, not limited to sexual minorities um, in the Caribbean that is free, open source for anybody to use. We are very excited that we are actually doing a new collection with Sargasso. And that is, um, it's coming out of the Theorizing Homophobias project, which was really important and really meaningful, but seemed in some ways to have kind of a negative bent focusing on homophobia. So this one is entitled Love, Hope, Community, Sexualities and Social Justice in the Caribbean. And really, we're, we're, what we were thinking about in putting this together is that movements for sexual citizenship and equal rights for sexual minorities across the region, and particularly in the Anglophone and Hispanophone parts of the region, are growing and have garnered local and international media attention. There are recent court cases challenging discriminatory laws, backlash and frenzy over a so-called gay lobby in certain parts of the region. And we're at an interesting juncture of visibility, misrepresentation, anti-sexual minority violence, increased activism, lawsuits, and the project of ongoing survival. It's a vital time to respond to recent events critically and to form myriad, from myriad perspectives, as well as to reflect on these movements. What is the landscape of sexual minority activism across the region? Who are the regional activists? And what are the most recent, re recent developments? And how are these issues being represented in the media, in popular culture, and in cultural productions in the different languages of the Caribbean? How do we build, minor build community, forge resistance to violence and discrimination, and at the same time, demand equal rights and treatment under the law? Where is our hope and love? How do we build community? These are the questions that we want this collection to answer. So we're planning a diverse collection, again, of critical essays, activist reports, interviews, profiles, creative writing, poetry, book reviews, which we didn't include the last time, visual and performance art, music, film, and any other work that reflects on the struggle and movements for sexual justice in the Caribbean. And yes, we are including Central and South American coastal areas and their diasporas. So as with our first collection, we seek to disrupt the divide between academia and community and art while locating theories and knowledge in multiple sites and discourses. We value and privilege local voices in these conversations. The collection is going to be edited by myself, Angelique Nixon, Catherine Miranda, and Lawrence Lafontaine Stokes. Sargasso, for those of you who don't know, and their site doesn't seem to be working, uh, is a peer-reviewed journal of literature. I'll just leave that up because their home page isn't working. It's a peer-reviewed journal of literature, language, and culture, which is edited at the University of Puerto Rico at Rio Piedras, which features critical essays, interviews, reviews, as well as poems and short stories from across the Caribbean. It's been published at UPR for 30 years and is affiliated with the Department of English and the College of Humanities. It's a print journal that also features open online access through DLAC. So for our second collection, we are partnering in order to have both a printed and an online regional journal space, as well as a multimedia online space to continue and expand these conversations. The collection is similar to theorizing homophobias in the breadth that we seek to cover, but Love, Hope, and Community will be different because Sargasso is going to have provide the printed component of the journal, while the IRN websites will feature the multimedia content and eventually the essays as well. So this collaboration will expand each in each organization's audience, and I think that we will really be complementing each other. The deadline is January 15th, so I hope that some of you in the room will consider submitting. There is, if you just, um, if you Google IRN and Sargasso, you'll get many hits to the call for submissions, but we're interested in a wide variety of material. We're especially interested in people writing about the court cases that are going on in the region and comparing those court cases to other places in the global south, not just to places in the global north. Um, so you can ask us questions about any of these materials, and both Angelique and I will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's indeed a real, an amazing website that we've been using for many years. So uh, we'll move on to our next.
presentation by Tanya, and we'll switch screens, maybe. easier to do it this way. Can you hear us? Yeah, I, I, I yeah. can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes? OK. And is the PowerPoint working, or do you need me to share my screen with everybody? It's, it's working. It's good? OK. So shall I just begin? Yes. Yeah. Oh, OK. I, I also need it? to mute it's my getting own it full screen. feed that I'm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Tanya. OK, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for providing this opportunity for me to speak to you about a project that I've started maybe about a year now, but it still, still feels like I'm very, a very kind of green and young project that I'm starting out looking at Caribbean cyber feminisms. And if you are on Twitter, you can follow me on Twitter at Red for Gender. It's the Twitter account of Code Red for Gender Justice, which I manage. And so you can find me there. And you should also check out the Catchify hashtag, which is a hashtag that we use online to really kind of collate tweets with reference to things that would be of interest to Caribbean feminists or really anything about the Caribbean and social justice work. So if we can just go to the advance beyond the title slide. So by way of introduction to thinking through this question of Caribbean cyber feminism and what it is and what it would look like, I just wanted to introduce you to the Catch a Fire Caribbean Feminist Network, which is now about two, just a bit over two years old. And an interesting story, I was representing the network and a group of regional CSOs at a global consultation at the UN headquarters in New York. And one of the UN interns came up to me to say that he was looking for Catch a Fire online and he did not find a website. And there was this sense that he, I, I felt almost like he was questioning perhaps the legitimacy of this organization that does not come with a singular web presence. And at the time, we, we are an organization made up of women's and LGBT rights organizations, primarily women from the Caribbean working in those organizations. So we were all affiliated with either kind of national or local organizations and came together as one big network. So the Catch a Fire online presence was actually very diverse, fragmented, and not managed by any single person or located in a singular website. But this notion that your what your web presence has come to mean is part of the kinds of questions that I want to think through in this project about what it means to be online, but also what do, what do Caribbean online feminisms look like. And so here you just have some images from our first grounding. In the corner there on the left is uh, some beautiful artwork that's also our sign-in sheet for the day. And you have our hashtag. So if we can move forward to the following slide. So this area of looking at Caribbean digital cultures in kind of, whether it be in scholarly work or in literature, is emerging, I think, and also very much under-researched. Earlier, I was following the program, and one of the presenters referred to this, the flotsam of the Caribbean digital space and the need for some filters to, I assume, filter out that, that flotsam. And I think that in some ways, what I'm most curious about is what could also be characterized as flotsam. And you have, for me, some really important works coming from the region 
that are seeking to take on this question of Caribbean digital cultures. And I always like to start with Nalo Hopkinson and what she said about her own work and how she was imagining technologies through an African diasporic lens. In terms of work on rhetoric, we have Kevin Brown's Tropic Tendencies, which <laughs> in thinking about rhetoric as different from Caribbean philosophy and also different from Caribbean thought and a, a space that is also somewhat different from the literary, taking up what Caribbean people, Caribbean readers do online and really being pioneering in doing that kind of a reading. I'm also very useful for me in this project of looking at Caribbean cyber feminisms and thinking about what that would look like you know, Juana Maria Rodriguez's Queer Latinidad and the chapter that she has on Confessions of a Latina Cyber Slut. So I think that it's a very exciting and growing feel of turning to what Caribbean people do online and that it might be important to also not just filter out the flotsam but to pay some attention to it as well. So moving on to talk about Caribbean cyberspace. Next slide. So coming out of some of that work that I mentioned, you have Miller and Slater's very important ethnography of the internet, and they focus particularly on Trinidad and come away with this understanding that representing the nation is a key part of what Caribbean people do online and a key part of their online identities. And this particular notion is of how representing the nation is something that Caribbean, that's an important part of what Caribbean people do, is also crucial for me in when I think of the different online projects that feminists and activists are creating throughout the region. I'm trying to have you ignore the, the ringing telephone in the office. Hopefully it will stop. So where, where was I? So I was talking about this notion of representing the nation and how crucial that is when you think about the different kinds of online campaigns and how to make sure that a campaign hails a diversity of Caribbean people, uh, recognizing how important this representing the nation is. And that'll be, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Also important for me of thinking of Caribbean cyberspace is how the countries that make up 75% of the region are also those that have the lowest internet penetration rates. And how as we think about the promise of the digital and what these digital spaces and technologies are going to do for us, that we also think about the differential access to such technologies. In fact, very recently I think uh, a Caribbean po um, politician referred to the articulate minority, and this is a Jamaican politician, the articulate minority that is on Twitter to suggest that like outrage on Twitter is not representative of the nation, so to speak, that is just a quote unquote articulate minority. And also to think of cyberspace as um, Juana Maria Rodriguez proposes as this site of gender and sexual play, of queering of identities, practices, and embodiment. So on to this term, cyber feminism. So if we can go to the next slide. So the term cyber feminism itself is really very much in disuse. Most of the scholarship and even some activists were around these questions tends to talk more about online feminisms. And the earliest usage of this term, cyber feminism, is credited to the, uh, an artist collective from Australia known as the VNS Matrix in their Cyber Feminist Manifesto. And some of the proposals for why the term feminism might be fallen in, cyber feminism might be fallen into this use relate to the fact that the, prom, the so called promise of the digital has not been realized. And I'll talk about that a bit, but now I want to share why. For me, I am retaining this term of cyber feminism to think about this particular project. So we have three ways in which the term cyber feminism has been used. I hope you're seeing the next slide that says defining cyber feminism. 
So one is the feminist analyses of human machine relations, embodiment, gender, and agency in a culture saturated with technology. Another is a critical feminist position for interrogating and intervening in specific, in specific technological forms and practices. And the third being gendered user cultures of information and communication, technologies, and digital media, media their emancipatory uses, as well as the social hierarchies and divisions involved in their production and ubiquitous presence. And all three meanings of this term are important for me as I seek to understand Caribbean cyber feminisms, but I'm particularly interested in what would a critical Caribbean feminist position and approach to technology and new media look like? And who might be useful for thinking through this, both scholars, but also seeing that based on the rise of these feminist blogs that I'm examining, that you see some very, very fine and sophisticated readings of Caribbean culture coming from some of the bloggers um, who are just publishing out, um, online. So the next slide. So I think I mentioned this already, the idea that the, the 1990s promise of the digital has not been fulfilled and how that particular promise was also bound up in the idea that the, the digital would somehow free us from gendered and racialized bodies. And in the, its framing in that particular kind of way, already this space that was supposed to be so democratizing was one that was already highly racialized and gendered and with divisions along multiple axes, including nations as well. So at that very, if you read a lot of that material of the 90s, which is very kind of hopeful and expectant of this promise of the digital, you see specific bodies being written out of it. And Alondra Nelson has some very good work on this area. So moving forward. So thinking in terms of internet studies, I'm very, I, I should have mentioned before, like I spend a lot of time online. I'm on practically every social network, but at the same time, I do think it's very important to think critically about how we engage and what we are engaging in. And also recognizing that the commercial, consumptive and entertainment uses of the internet predominate and that they also tend to reinforce a notion of an individual apolitical consuming self as the modal way of being online. And even from everything from the kinds of ads that get targeted to you, I get frequent ads on Facebook for these paid promotional ads that for some reason are being pushed to my page for things like um, prosthetic hair, for example. So the ways in which these technologies often reinforce a particular kind of a self as the modal way of being online. And how we should not think about the internet as a virtual place, but thinking of how much it is embedded in social spaces and is also coextensive with them. Next slide, please. So in terms of thinking about Caribbean cyber feminism as a critical perspective on technology and new media, I begin from the position that neither, neither feminism nor cyberspace itself is innocent. And helping me to make those kinds of connections, I turn, for example, to Sylvia Winter's thought and how she theorizes the epistem. And also um, Tony Bogues, who talks about this notion of an empire of liberty, whereby the US's empire has appropriated the language of freedom and promotes this definitive way in which humankind is to construct ways of living. And I think about how being online and engaging in certain kinds of technology come to be implicated in these singular definitive ways uh, in which hum humankind is supposed to construct ways of living. One of the earlier slides had the book cover for some work done by a journalist from Jamaica called Marcia Forbes. And one of the things that came out in her research on how young people use social media is the way how non-access to social media was, was read as this 
another kind of stigmatizing marker of class by the young people who didn't have like frequent, frequent access to Facebook, for example. So thinking about how new media and technologies are also implicated in this empire of liber liberty, so to speak, or in particular ways of being human. So I pay attention not only to feminist online practices and how some of what Caribbean feminists do online might be potentially subversive, but also how it may also be complicit with a certain self-legitimating understanding of what it means to be human. So as a, as a project, as a methodology, part of what I want to do is think about my own experience of being online, of keeping a blog from even before I started imagining myself as doing anything called feminist scholarship and being part of a pan-Caribbean community of, of bloggers writing in the early 2000s, but also investigating the different kinds of communities that Caribbean feminists and particularly young Caribbean women, but also young men have created online, through online spaces, ways of creating community and what are the concerns, um, what are they talking about, what are they doing, how are they using online media to organize and how are they not, and how might their activism be continuous with older um, or previous modes of organizing and where, where might there be some forms of shift. The project also includes content analysis of um, a set of blogs, a set of blogs from written by persons living in the region and also in the diaspora. So these include blogs that are explicitly feminist in their content, as well as the ways in which through what Patricia Mohammed calls gender consciousness, a lot of Caribbean people are talking gender now or talking about sexuality in very explicit um, ways that they were not before. And looking at all of that material as well, as well as interviewing and conversing with cyber feminists and activists and writers and artists who are part of this Caribbean cyber feminisms. So just to turn to blogging, which is where I'm going to end in my presentation, the Global Voices, um, which is the platform I'm sure that many of you know of, there's a specific Caribbean content being curated at, on Global Voices as well. And one of the articles they carried looked at the history of Caribbean blogging. And it was very interesting because the author presented some kind of key moments in Caribbean blog history. And then in the comments, you had some bloggers coming in to say, well, hey, actually, you mentioned that as the first Caribbean blog, but I was actually writing since then at this particular space. And for me, what was also interesting was how important women and feminist bloggers from the region were in thinking about Caribbean blog history. So blogs like Guyana Gal, which started in 2005 and is still active, and a no longer active blog called by a blogger using the handle Titaleo from Barbados. So, so far, there are about 28 blogs that I've been working with, and these are the categories that I've used to describe them. And the categories that predominate are these personal is political blogs, which are where persons use their personal experience to think through questions of unequal relations of gender and power, race, ethnicity, in the Caribbean and the culture critic blogs, which are the blogs offering very, very, as I said, some very insightful analyses and reflections on Caribbean culture and Caribbean people and who we are, is the, is the other really broad category of blogs called the culture critic blogs. And the majority of these blogs are also personal, is political blogs. You have some blogs that just curate from the Caribbean, that curate a lot of feminist content, and also a significant portion of blogs that are not explicitly feminist blogs that treat multiple themes, but also treat themes of gender and sexuality in a really, really positive way. 
So to wrap up, because I think I must be nearing the, um, having exhausted the allotted, allotted time. So I wanna look at the slide that says, examining Caribbean cyber activism, just to give some really important moments in Caribbean cy feminist cyber activism. So there's an organization called the Goat Dairy Project in Grenada who crowdfunded tens of thousands of dollars. And the person responsible for that funding is also a Catch a Fire member and a co-founder of another organization called Groundation Grenada. And that for me was one very kind of tangible and visible and important aspect of how Caribbean feminists are using online media. We've also had a few posts that have gone viral, one in particular called an open letter to Caribbean men from a Caribbean woman that had really thousands and thousands of shares across the internet. And most recently there was another post on it was, it was on colorism in Trinidad, and I think it was, I can't remember the title of it, but it was probably about two weeks ago, I posted it to the Claude Red Facebook page, and on our page alone, there were like 5,000 interactions with this article. And on the page where it's actually published, you can see thousands of Facebook shares, this article in which a young woman talks about being, um, about growing up dark-skinned in Trinidad, for example. Other instances are the, the a YouTube video called Real Man Narrate that a group of young Jamaican men came together to produce in response to sexual violence in the community. The ways in which how self-identified and non-self-identified feminists have organized to shut down sexist websites, so by having are organizing online and getting everybody to go on this website and cause it to crash because they're not accustomed to that much traffic and you're not going because you want to help them get more hits, but to really shut it down because of its sexist content. So these are some of the things that Caribbean feminists have been able to do. And even the advertisement for an, a, a rum, there was an advertisement that had the tagline avoid the friend zone, offer her a real drink. And part of it was the backlash online by lots of people. So again, this is how the gender consciousness comes in. So I'm not saying that the people who organized this were people who self-identified as feminists or who belong to a feminist organization, but the kind of consciousness around these issues that led to a public backlash and the advertisement being pulled, even though well, something is in cyberspace, it's kind of there forever. So lastly, in terms of next steps, I'm particularly interested in hearing feedback and responses to the project both the idea of mapping and documenting and thinking about what Caribbean people are doing online in terms of feminist and queer political activism, but also thinking through if there is any particular perspective from the Caribbean on technology and new media that we should be developing. If there's a need for a Caribbean cyber feminism, is there such a thing? So I'll end there and I'll thank you very much for accommodating me, technology, ringing telephone, and my own general craziness, all in all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And now we'll have our final speaker, Keith McNeil. pioneering conference release. An honor to be here. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today uh, concerns material uh, that's part of a, that's, it forms part of a current book project on the politics of sexuality and citizenship in Trinidad and Tobago. 
which has been incubating for many years now, um, but, I, but I began sort of focused work on it uh, two years ago as a, a Fulbright Scholar at IGDS in, at UE in St. Augustine. Um, the book focuses on men, gender, sexuality, and um, sort of culture, cultural politics um, and sexual culture. Um, what I'm going to talk about today comes from the fifth chapter, which deals specifically with the development and impact of various new forms of communication technologies and digital media on sexual consciousness, identity, and practice. Now, I would just say, I mean, I want to start off by um, uh, who, someone yesterday said that, you know, I'm a sort of recovering technophobe. I, too, sort of come to this without, um, I didn't sort of go into it um, with this in mind, so my focus on this is unintended, but as I got deeper and deeper into the work, in, you know, at, including as a participant observer myself across many platforms and forms of social media, I realized that the material deserved an entire chapter of its own in order to fully document and analyze the layered impact and time-released transformations of how new communications technologies um, since the introduction of the cellular phone through the advent of the internet and its many applications and manifestations such as ICQ and, li and live chat as well as sexually oriented social networking sites such as Adam for Adam known as A for A in the lingo through the development of smartphones that harness the power of both cellular communications technologies with the, with the internet um, thereby in thereby intensifying and further transforming the sociosexual landscape and horizons of possibility for people. Indeed, there are now smartphone-based hookup applications such as Grindr um, that have caught on only over the last, say, two years or so, um, which inc now incorporate uh, GPS, um, uh, what is that, geo-positioning, um, into their um, into the into the program, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, that is also sort of doing new things as well. Um, all right. Now, in uh, a relatively recent state-of-the-art review of the field of Caribbean sexuality studies in 2009, um, only five years ago now or so, Kamala Kempadu acknowledged the influences and the role of new technological and innovations on Caribbean sexual culture and praxis, but she only refers at one point along the way to positive shifts in attitudes toward homosexuality due to increased exposure to gay imagery on TV, and cites no work specifically focused on the role and influences of any new technological innovations in communications and digital media on sexual culture and praxis. Indeed, in recent work, one of the emergent, emerging scholarly authorities on Caribbean cyber culture, Kerwin Best, observes that research must now play catch up with, uh, with various proliferating developments in the domains of di digital culture and social media and that we can no longer afford to treat them as afterthoughts. This whole conference is clearly, um, uh, doesn't have that problem, but maybe some of us are playing catch up. My own focus in this area um, is symptomatic um, in that um, it wasn't that I was sort of naive or wasn't thinking about communications, technologies, phone, uh, digital, social media, but I just sort of thought I would sort of mention it along the way as I analyze people's life histories and these kinds of things. Um, uh, so it was not quite an afterthought, but it wasn't really focal. Uh, when I began uh, working on this book project, um, but it was only after hearing over and over again from people that the internet had revolutionized, and that's a term that's used very, very often, it's very common, everything for, for them and in, in society that it all started coming onto my research uh, radar screen in a more focal way. Um, and indeed, once I thought about it, I realized there's now an entire generation of young folk who have been weaned in a hypermediated environment. Um, and so then I also started talking to m more mature men and older heads. Um, they also emphasized what an amazing impact cell phones and especially computer-based communications have had upon TNT's socio-sexual landscape. 
So for a time, I too sort of thought that cumulative digitalization of experience as a kind of primarily progressive or liberatory trend um, in line with the dominant line of thinking and experience on the ground, um, you know, namely that access to the internet operates as a gateway to like-minded others locally as well as the rest of the world and its imagery, politics, activism, and other uh, so on and so forth, um, that all of these things uh, have accentuated the sort of revolutionary experience of YouTube, Facebook, other kinds of things that, uh, that we've been talking about, not to mention easy access to pornographic materials that facilitate fantasy and allow um, men to imagine concretely what, other what otherwise might remain largely fleeting or abstract or fantastical in their own minds. Um, the recent Karamis survey, which was done in November, I think it's no, late 2011 to, to mid-2012, the Karamis survey was, um, is a UNAIDS-funded survey more than somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 men all throughout the entire region. Actually, there's great representation from Cuba to Suriname and everywhere. Um, found that 55% of men, of, of respondents, had never visited a gay community center organization or social group, and only 35% had attended a homosexually oriented or gay friendly bar or party whereas 93% had visited websites targeted at MSMs, that's the lingo for men who have sex with men, and including 84% had done so in the last month. Of course, these capabilities and practices didn't develop overnight, and reconstructing the history of all of this is part of what I'm currently engaged in as part of this project. So to just kind of quickly um, sort of uh, sketch a kind of trajectory, um, early on, early in this case being like, you know, early to mid 90s, uh, early, early on um, there, the, there was sort of strategic creative use of first generation um, Caribbean specific social media such as chat rooms, you know, like online chat rooms, and then connecting with people and branching off into private ICQ chat. Um, Various of my interlocutors, interviewees, and friends have emphasized how profound it was for them um, making fledgling connections in such fora, uh, whether or not they, uh, these interactions and these connections actually led to face-to-face -face interactions or not. In fact, it seems to my, my impression is that more often than not, it didn't, but it was just a really profound experience just connecting with people and having some kind of conversation or interaction. Uh, Danny Miller and Don Slater's study of the internet in the late 90s, published in 2000. Tanya had a picture of the book up, uh, in one of the slides. Uh, Miller and Slater report surreptitious use of a, a cyber cafe back room um, by groups of homosexual men for gay-themed surfing and consumption of sexually explicit materials. It's interesting that it was done in groups. Um, yet now cyber cafes are, have basically become obsolete and are pretty much a quickly fading memory for most people. Um, more recently, I would say about eight years ago, um, still trying to hone in on exactly when, when it surfaced in Trinidad, um, but certainly more than five, less than ten years ago, Adam for, was the, the advent of Adam for Adam, A for A. Um, a, a social networking site with local, regional, and global dimensions that facilitates direct interaction between men within the privacy of their own home or wherever they use a computer online um, for all sorts of reasons, trading pictures, getting to know one another, conversing, making new friends, finding dates, chatting in explicitly sexual terms, masturbating, and quite frequently to solicit sexual partners and coordinate meetups. That's where the term, uh, the phrase in my title, coming out software, comes from, because one of my friends said, Adam for Adam, it's my, you know, it was, it was my coming out software. I think it's really great, really great phrase. Um, so I'm using it now with his permission. Uh, the next generation, in a sense, is uh, internet-mediated social networking platforms such as Grindr and Scruff. Um, Grindr is way more popular than Scruff 
in Trinidad and Tobago. I hear that Jact is coming um, online there too, but I don't quite know about Jact yet. Anyway, Grindr is definitely the most um, uh, the most uh, popular of the sort of online smartphone-based hookup apps. Um, but since they're cell phone based and incorporate GPS technology, what happens is that when you, ha you have a profile and you, when you go online, um, everyone is sorted in terms of their distance from you. So, you know, on the page, you have your little thumb, your little tile, your little thumbnail profile. Um, and then the next one next to you is the person who's closest. So if we were online, you know, our tiles would be, and then, so everyone is sorted in progressive distance from, from the self, um, which in uh, the intention of the um, programmers for these kinds of uh, GPS-based hookup apps is that it, you know, makes it more convenient to meet up with someone you know, because if they're just next door, you know, it, and they will say, you know, less than 800 feet away, 1.3 miles away, these kinds of things. The intention was to make it easier and more convenient and efficient to hook up with people or meet them. However, in the Caribbean, a very interesting sort of like inversion of the original intention is that, of course, a lot of people that if the, the people who are next to you in your t on your tiles are exactly the people you don't want to see because those are the people in your neighborhood, down the street, people who know your family. So that's actually a sure, you know, a sure sign like, hey, definitely, so you're scrolling, you want to get further, not everyone, but a lot of people want to get further away as opposed to the people who are closer. And then you can also delete, you can block people, so you can just block them and that just basically deletes them from ever coming up on your, um, your hookup radar ever again. Um, another relevant digitally mediated development is camming, webcamming via Skype or Facebook cam chat. Um, there are other ways of doing it, but definitely Skype and Facebook camming are the, are the most popular in Trinidad and Tobago, in which two people exchange contact information and meet up online in order to chat or have cyber sex with each other um, live which many guys like and even prefer since it's inherently safe um, and involves no hassle or risk. Now, I've just sort of briefly glossed some of these developments and transformations here, but they point to the varied ways they have transformed the sociosexual landscape and profoundly impacted people's lives and patterns of personal experience. What I've described thus far accords not only with a dominant theme in many people's reflections about the role and influence of technological developments in, the, in their lives, but also a prominent position in scholarly work on digital culture and experience, namely the positively sort of transformative, uh, potentially liberatory um, role of the internet and social media in everyday life and political consciousness. However, my exploration of technology and sexuality in TNT has also clearly evidenced the other side of the coin, the multifarious ways new communications technologies do not necessarily transform or liberate, but in fact reproduce the status quo or even foster conservative retrenchments, even as they facilitate alternative sexual liaison and explorations. To give a non-computer example, one friend of mine has had for a long time a separate phone none of his family or even most of his friends know about that he calls his gay phone since he uses it to communicate with, his, with a select group of gay friends and sort of homosexual acquaintances in order to sort of facilitate his kind of, you know, other life um, or coordinate um, trysts with, with selected folks. He, but even having his gay phone number doesn't mean that people know his name since he uses a, a pseudonym within the kind of underground homosexual community, which is also a pretty common practice. Um, I've, I mean, now I'm kind of used to it, but you know, it's happened so many times where you, I get to know someone as, you know, whatever, a name, and then, you know, Indar is no longer Indar. It turns out to be Lloyd, or, you know, you find out six months later, and it's just, it's a very interesting experience. Also extremely common practice of either, um, uh, another extremely common practice um, is, involves not having any photos online in order to maintain one's anonymity or using pics of just parts of one's body, like a nipple or genitalia or, you know, just 
a shoulder or something, um, so as to remain unidentifiable online, or even using entirely fake photos to, to represent oneself online. And there's a very uh, kind of complicated sort of nuanced kind of subculture of sort of navigating and negotiating authenticity of I imagery um, online. I learned this the hard way as a naive newbie online locally some years ago and only gradually developed the visual and conversational skills necessary for vetting and confirming people's pics in cyberspace. Um, this plays out in the micro-political negotiations over who opens their private pics. Some, you know, like Adam for Adam, for example, you have your public profile. Well, you don't have to. You can, you can not have a public profile, but, but you have a, like an, uh, um, up to five um, private pics, like a private album, and you can selectively open them for people, um, just, just them. Um, but sometimes it's a long, drawn-out tug of war trying to figure out who's going to open their picks first, um, you know, and that kind of thing. It's, it's quite, it's quite, um, it's very complicated. Not, and and th th this politics of visibility is, um, you know, I'm talking about the politics of visibility vis-a-vis -vis picks, but it also operates in relation to um, the countless other kind of ways that the politics of visibility and, um, uh, and, um, and representing self-representation and also desire plays out online, along with things like no femmes, no blacks, these kinds of so-called preferences that people state. Um, the politics of visibility also plays out in camming, um, when your cam partner comes online and you literally never see their face and possibly don't e even hear their voice. Um, in such scenarios, I mean, in some of these scenarios, they either want to watch or be watched or mutually like masturbate simultaneously, and then um, and then they'll just like hang up immediately after um, they have an orgasm, and it's like click gone. You know, it's very sort of um, uh, transient interaction and completely and utterly anonymous. Uh, meanwhile, TNT has also taught me how creatively and strategically Facebook can be. Um, since there are countless ways people access and operate within Facebook space in order to surreptitiously find out information, make new connections, cruise others or cruise others' friends, um, etc., on a platform that is not overtly sexual or pornographic and therefore um, it's like, convenient um, because you can kind of hide your activities sort of in, in daylight um, from family and friends, for example. People, there are fake profiles, fake pictures, um, but I also know of, for example, people who will email people, you know, messaging on Facebook, but, but not even, they won't add you as a friend, but I've had pl plenty of people sort of, you know, contact me and tap me up and want to be friends, but actually we're not friends officially on Facebook. Um, so um, Facebook can sort of, there's sort of levels of operation that people um, uh, use and operate online in Facebook. Um, other examples, you know, guys will have a, their profile picture be with a woman, you know, so to sort of kind of perform or mask as being in a heterosexual relationship or having their relationship status, you know, having a, a, a female name, um, you're either with them or married to um, a, a woman. Um, what was in the other example? Oh, strategic friending and unfriending. You know, it's not like you, you're sort of friends and then you're just in perpetuity friends or maybe you have a fight and you get defriended. It's like sequential friending and unfriending. That happens um, on Facebook as well. Uh, so, and a, a lot of trainees call uh, Facebook Fastbook, right? Because, or Mockobook, it's a you know, great way to sort of track people and see what's going on and mock each other's business. Um, in all of these ways, many men who are closeted, down low, married, and so forth, avail themselves of online resources in order to make surreptitious social and especially sexual connections while maintaining anonymity and risking as little as possible. Um, I have not only become aware of how prevalent these, uh, these cases are, 
but also increasingly um, impressed in the descriptive, not normative sense, I guess maybe, nor I don't know, but uh, impressed that technological developments of these types, uh, of the type considered here, have in fact made possible uh, sexual interactions and relations for closeted, down low, and married men, I'm almost finished, that they may not have otherwise had. So they're having more gay sex, basically, um, than they ever would, right? Having to sort of, you know, develop a kind of relationship with someone in your neighborhood or at school or work or whatever, but have to risk sort of, you know, all of that. Um, it's very quick, easy for people to have more gay sex, but at the same time uh, remaining um, entirely anonymous and, um, and, and closeted or down, or down low. So I'm still working on this project, but my provisional working conclusion is that developments in communications technologies and new media generate multiple effects that are mixed, complex, contradictory, and even paradoxical. Reality is complex and messy, and social developments in social media and cyber culture may amplify and intensify the status quo while also facilitating profound transformations in consciousness and praxis. Um, and at this point, my own sort of thinking is that um, we just need to do a lot more. We, do, we really do need to play catch up in terms of just work, ethnographic, empirical, all kinds of you know, research and documentation and analysis before we can really you know, get too gung-ho about sort of doing big theory with a capital T at this point. You know, the, the temptation, the allure of theorizing is um, always there, but I think we need to do a lot more um, research before we can really start you know, put, you know, theorizing um, uh, Caribbean digital culture vis-a-vis -vis sexuality and gender. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're just on time. Do we have five minutes for questions? There's like a 15 minute break now, so maybe we'll have a 10 minute sure. break and we'll have a few minutes for questions if there are any questions. Yeah. Questions, comments? Yes, Alex? Yeah, I, 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 I just love the last point that you made. Just as a, I mean, I totally agree. And when I started thinking about, wait, what is the history of cell? When did cell phones come on? You know, I, I had no idea, really. I mean, you know, sort of approximately. And then I thought, what? Wait, what's the internet? I don't know. There's so much, you know, that we. Uh, that, I mean, I personally and most people don't have any idea what, what these black boxes are. Yeah. Yes, Nigel. Um, I guess I may go maybe devil's advocate with what um, Alex just said, sorry, um, in a sense that um, there are still questions about the self, right, in social spaces that are going through all these panels, right? There is a way in which like, we're trying to think about how does digital technology mediate social relationships and how do we respond to that, those modes of mediation. And um, I guess whereas, um, for instance, the Facebook example, while we have uh, advertisement that targets us to the extent that uh, it almost tells us who we should be when we go online in the sense that, like I have sneakers that I 
look for on one website and then next thing you know they show up on another website. Um, that still provides an occasion for us to still think of the same questions we have, which is about how are these social forces trying to produce us as subjects and intelligible subjects. And I guess um, maybe could the panel speak to the limitations of available categories uh, for political practice or even resistance that they came across um, while teaching and also exploring these different um, social spaces. And is, it, is Alex correct in the sense that we need to come up with a totally new vocabulary for thinking about the digital or is there about new methodologies that we need? So. I'll give a, a brief response, kind of less, less in relationship to the digital, but more in relationship to sexuality studies. And I think we need to listen more. So, um, you know, the terms often that scholars use to describe people's sexuality in the Caribbean are not often the terms that people themselves are using. So, the court case that's going on in Guyana, which has really been taken up as a transgender cause, most of those people actually call themselves gay, right? So, um, I think if we pay more attention to what people themselves are saying, now um, whether you call them subcultures or just part of other cultures that are in the region, I think that we can actually use those terms in our own research. Well, I don't know if Angelique and Tanya have anything to say, but I, I would just add that in addition to methodological and I guess um, analytical vocabulary, I've been thinking more about ethics. I've also been thinking more and more about ethics, you know, like doing research. What about screenshot? Like, what's, what are the ethics of taking a screenshot of stuff? You know, I mean, I, okay, I'm doing it for my own documentary purposes, but then I have a growing archive of these, of my own digital images of digital life. What about consent? You know, the, the blurring of public and private is, is very, is very messy. And I, I don't have, I just have questions. I just have proliferating questions without many answers at this point for myself. I don't know about. Yeah, just to pick up on what you were saying, Keith, about the ethics of it. I remember when I started doing this, um, Corred also has a Tumblr, so I put it on Tumblr, like, share with me any Caribbean feminist blogs that you know of. And there were these publicly available blogs and People would share them and say, here is one, but before you read it, and this is something that had I stumbled upon it, it would, it would have been fine. Here is one, but before you read it, you need, or, or cite it, or include it in your study, you need to go ask, this is the email address for the person who owns it. So the ways in which they're kind of different iterations of private, even in very, very public spaces and platforms, and how do you do the work ethically? Before I started even thinking of this in terms of scholarship and research, I was a part of lots of online groups and online communities, and suddenly now you have to step back as a researcher and go through the IRB protocols, which are not even caught up to the digital right. what you're doing. And so there's this sense of, well, how much of this is my experience, and how much of it do I have to get kind of consent for the fact that your own experience is also bunged up in somebody else's and that things that you and that you're not just there kind of looking on but that you are and were and continue to be a part of com a community and communities from even before you started to think about it in terms of research work so the, the area of ethics is extremely messy very very much still unexplored, I would say, and even in terms of coming up with a set of protocols and parameters for ourselves as scholars, we're just not there yet. Yeah, I agree with Tanya, and I've had similar experiences too, really thinking about the ethics of all of the research, reading research and becoming, I remember being in graduate school and really thinking carefully about and being disturbed by some of the material I would read and think about the ethics behind it and wanting to be and forge myself as a different kind of researcher because I was already grounded in a different way of thinking about community before. Um, but I wanted to just say that I think it's interesting that there's a group here in Trinidad and Tobago that's decided to do their own storytelling and it's really in response to some of 
the researchers who come, Trinidad is kind of a hub for people to come and, and do different kinds of work. And so this uh, sexual and gender minority um, organization is really gr really grounded in kind of social networking and online presence and wanting to create a different way to think about sexual and gender minorities, working with KAISO. Um, and they started a new research project and I'm helping them design and think about it. And they're interviewing people who identify with sexual and gender minority communities and because they want to create an archive of the stories and they want to do the interviews themselves. And most of them are young people, I would say in their 20s and early 30s. And they're doing it really in response to the sort of proliferation of Global North stories. And also they're using the work of uh, organizations like Kachafaya and Code Red for Gender Justice, Foundation Grenada, and the Caribbean IRN as a kind of basis for saying that, yeah, we need to do our own work and we need to create our own stories and they're going to do some art projects about it and it's really exciting. So I want to just put that out there because I do think that there are conversations being had in different spaces about what it means to tell stories, what it means to do research, and thinking about it in a different kind of way. Great. I think we'll wrap up so we have five minutes um, to take a break before the final panel. Let's thank our speakers.